I have never been good at picking winners. My first console taught me everything there was to love about video games. It lost. In the next generation, my first choice redefined what I could love about video games. It lost. In the next generation, my first choice was destined to be my all-time favorite video game console, and it lost harder than any of them. I didn't do this intentionally, I wasn't trying to be a contrarian. I mean, I was a literal child, I didn't even know what that word meant. It just always seemed like the games, and the trends, and the style that spoke to my soul was always, at best, the less popular option. And when the Dreamcast died, I made a new choice, and once again found myself backing the loser. As the PlayStation 2 crushed everything else in the market, it seemed to reshape the industry and its image. The GameCube, they said, represented everything gaming wasn't anymore. Games were supposed to be sophisticated and intelligent and mature. They were supposed to take themselves seriously. These were the titles that were pushing the industry to unprecedented new heights. Meanwhile, you had Nintendo over here pushing cartoony games for babies. And while I loved some of these games, it didn't seem like anybody else did. It was Nintendo's lowest point to that point. Given just how recent and just how traumatic Sega's exit from the console business had been for me, I was genuinely worried that this might be it for Nintendo. That this might be it for the kinds of games that I liked most. This fear was carried mostly by the fact that I'd just never been through it before, but also by endless form posts and think pieces, and employees at video game stores who made fun of the system and by proxy me every single time I bought a GameCube game just directly telling me how out of touch Nintendo was. How the best thing for them, the only way they'd survive, would be to follow in Sega's footsteps and make games for the real consoles. I felt alienated. I felt like the evolution of my favorite hobby was passing me by. But it couldn't last forever. We would like to play. All of a sudden, Nintendo wasn't just back, they were back on top. Nintendo pivoted away from direct competition and made their audience everyone. In a lot of ways, Nintendo's revival in the 2000s mirrored their advent two decades earlier. Just as the NES shifted the paradigm and defined the trends that the rest of the market would follow, so too would the Wii. And all of a sudden, I was back and more invested than I had ever been before. It wouldn't be accurate for me to claim Nintendo was solely responsible for that. The seventh gen just had a lot going for it. And I'm sure just growing out of being a surly teenager helped a lot too. But still, the big end did have a whole lot to do with it. Nintendo had lightning in a bottle with the Wii. It wasn't always ideal, but after a generation of being told that the games I liked were too childish and out of style, it was just vindicating to see Nintendo thriving again. To see Nintendo winning again. The Wii was the first time I'd ever picked the winner. But this too couldn't last forever. First rumored in early 2011, Project Cafe would be the Wii's successor. And at E3 that year, Reggie fils would stand on stage and tell us what to expect. The Geek Critique, recorded on October 2nd, 2012. I'm Josh Wallen. I'm Lennon Martelli. And I'm Kaylin Miller. And we're here to talk about the Wii U. It's a system we will all enjoy together, but also one that's tailor-made for you. This is the new controller for Wii U. What do we think of the gamepad? Well, it's gonna change everything, really. Like, they'll probably have just dominance throughout the game market once it comes out. Well, it's kind of thinking, like, if it's a hit, but it's basically... I, I think it's gonna be a hit. I don't see why it wouldn't be a hit. So, they were calling it the Wii U. That gave me pause, but it also gave me deja vu. Well, let me set the scene. It's June of 2011, and for the first time in a long time, Nintendo is on the back foot. Well, maybe more than that. Maybe it's more like they came down hard on a gimmicky 3D handheld and broke their ankle. The 3DS would find its footing in time, but two months in, I cannot overstate how bleak its future already seemed. And here was Nintendo, seemingly, breaking their other ankle on the same mistake. 
the Wii U's name indicated it was still part of the Wii lineage. It would be able to play every game in its predecessor's library, but it would also maintain compatibility with the Wii Remote and all related accessories. And that distinction is important. Wii U games would be playable with Wii Remotes, and would sometimes even require them. When Nintendo hardware fails, typically the company pivots, but when a console succeeds, they maintain course. The Wii was, to that point, the most successful console Nintendo had ever made. So it follows, it makes sense that its successor would have a whole lot in common with it. But while I do get the thought process, I didn't and still don't get the name. Like, I knew what the deal was, but I was a dork spending my afternoon watching an industry trade show. Like, the name 3DS wasn't marketing genius or anything, but it sure looked like it next to this. Just look for the U on the box. Sticking the Wii name in there was inevitable, but Wii U didn't sound like a new console. Worryingly, it didn't even look like a new console. Especially because so much of the marketing was, of course, focusing primarily on the gamepad. A few years before it was a YouTube channel, The Geek Critique was a column that I wrote for my college newspaper. But while I wrote the articles, I did not write the headlines. That responsibility fell to my section editor. And when I wrote a piece about how the majority of people might have trouble understanding what Nintendo's new console was based on its name, here's the headline that she came up with. Nintendo Wii's U. What's in her name? Yep, kinda proved my point there. So why? In light of all of this, why were we still so optimistic in that audio I played back at the start of the episode? Yeah, it was mostly that. But besides that, while these factors may have been cause for concern, you gotta remember, it hadn't been that long ago that we were all struggling to wrap our heads around what the point of putting two screens on one handheld even was only to then see that dual-screen handheld dominate the market. It hadn't been that long ago that we'd been laughing about how stupid Nintendo was for changing the name of their next console from the Nintendo Revolution, a name that was so indicative of the renaissance and return to form that we so desperately wanted for the company and the industry, and they changed that to something as corny and juvenile as the Wii. Like, Forget about how well you know it and how normal it seems now, and think of how that must have sounded to us in 2006. The Wii. It was so sad it was funny. Yeah, there's some cars over there with the Wii. And they're touching their Wiis, apparently. But, it turns out, Nintendo did know what they were doing. That renaissance we wanted happened, despite the name, and maybe because of the name. The point is, Nintendo had proven conventional wisdom wrong a lot in the previous generation. So, why wouldn't we think it could happen again? Especially when in a matter of months, they managed to turn the 3DS from a laughing stock into a must-own, through a steep price cut and the arrival of a litany of killer apps. If the DS could thrive, if the Wii could thrive, if the 3DS could stage such a swift comeback, you'd be pretty dumb to bet against the Wii U, right? Right? November 18th, 2012. My bro Kaylin and I picked up our brand new Wii U's at midnight. Wii U's plural because we both got one. Deluxe editions, of course. It was only 50 bucks more, it had more storage, and access to a promotion where you could get money back on digital games. And most importantly, it came bundled with Nintendo Land, which would have made up the price difference all by itself. We loaded up on snacks and drinks, and headed back home for what would surely be a night of gaming euphoria. So let's pretend it's that night, and talk about the hardware itself. No, not that. That's boring. That's just a Wii with the edges rounded off. Although, I did find it funny how that meant that if you wanted to stand it vertically, you had to attach these finicky little feet. Rounding the edges off worked a lot better for the discs. I know it doesn't look too different, but trust me, it gives them a weirdly satisfying, premium feel. Now on its face, the Wii was also a function over form disk drive that boring adults wouldn't feel ashamed to have on their TV stands. But as similar as it is, I still think the design of the Wii U lacks the pizzazz of its predecessor. The Wii's sharp lines are accentuated by its platinum stand. The hardware design forms a distinct, unusual shape that's mirrored in many of its ports and peripherals. Most of all, that neon blue disc light gives it an air of clean sophistication, but also of whimsy. This is still a toy, after all. Albeit one that'll make you think you're getting abducted by aliens at 3 in the morning, but thank you for showing me your Pokemon snaps, Lennon. But compare the clean design of the Wii 
to the Wii U. Fart noise. This one basically is just a disc drive. But actually, that checks out. That makes sense, because, like it or not, for better and for worse, the real star of the show is right here. My first impression of the gamepad has been a consistent one. Wow, this thing is bulky! I don't necessarily mean that as a bad thing. In fact, I think this is another case where Nintendo prioritized function over form. When the Wii U was revealed back in 2011, the gamepad was noticeably much flatter and longer. It used 3DS circle pads instead of thumbsticks, and the shape was much more evocative of a tablet. But while Nintendo's handhelds will sacrifice some degree of comfort for the sake of portability, the gamepad was definitively not a portable. It has no capabilities whatsoever when it's out Outside of the console's range. Now I know that seems like a really weird choice now, but you gotta remember that back in 2012, it was really weird then too. I get it on a technical level. I remember how capable, or rather incapable, mobile hardware was in the late 2000s, and Nintendo wouldn't want to compete with themselves in the portable market anyway. But as a consumer, as a gamer, the idea that this giant hunk of plastic with a full control layout and a screen is totally incapable of playing games on its own is a bizarre thing to fathom. It was always the first question anyone had when I let them try it. They'd hold it and they'd say, So what can this thing do on its own? Nothing. Well, almost nothing. It can act as a TV remote, which was a lot more useful than you'd think. But besides that, nada. Now there was no way Wii U-level games were ever going to run natively on a tablet in 2012, but it would have been so cool if it would have had at least a little capability on its own. Something like a VMU on steroids that let you load mini-games, or even stuff from the Virtual Console. But because it wasn't portable, Nintendo saw fit to design it for comfort more than form. A lot of its bolt comes from this massive ridge that runs along the back, giving your fingers something to grip on. It's packed chock full of features, a front-facing camera, a touchscreen, a full controller layout with top-oriented thumbsticks, and this mysterious symbol which would turn out to be very important a few years down the road. And despite how big it is and how much it does, it is surprisingly lightweight given its size. Now considering it also has a gyro sensor, I guess it better be, but it's not especially solid. The fingerprint smudging black plastic means the gamepad absorbs dust like the GBA absorbed light thanks to the appropriately named Dustin VG for that line. And that, plus the fingerprint smudging shiny black plastic, does make it feel a bit cheap. Nowhere is this more obvious than the rumble. This doesn't feel like the strong force feedback of a game controller, it feels like the tacit notification vibration of a cell phone. I guess they figured you'd get a pro controller if you wanted a real motor. And this thing is a real hidden gem, by the way. It's super comfy and tactile. I love the layout with both thumbsticks up top, and it gets like 40 hours of battery life on a single charge. But the absolute worst part about the gamepad was, and increasingly is, that battery life. Despite having no onboard processing power of its own, the gamepad's battery is, and I am not making this up, even worse than the Sega Game Gear. That thing lasted three hours on six double A's. The gamepad, fully charged, gets you about two hours of play. At least it did in 2012. Over a decade later, I'm lucky if I get one hour of playtime out of it. And I suspect this is one more area where Nintendo cheaped out a little bit. They sold batteries that were physically bigger with a higher capacity in their online store, and the gamepad was fully capable of accommodating them. I guess that's the one saving grace, at least it's replaceable. In spite of my criticisms, in 2024, the gamepad strikes me with a surprisingly retro charm. Like, retro to me is measured by distance, not time. It's not like consoles turn 10 or 15 or even 20 and magically become retro. There's no threshold that it crosses chronologically. It's more of a feeling for me, of an era the industry has moved past. Like, they sure don't make them like this anymore. <laughs> and they really don't. Back in 2012, though, I was more interested in the function. That is, what sort of fresh new experiences would this controller make possible? We got two games with our Wii U's, and I'll tell you about the second one we played first. New Super Mario Bros. U was an absolute masterclass in platforming level design, and was overall such a blast that I played through the whole game twice, once in co-op with Kalen, and again concurrently on my own. But it didn't matter at all because it came out just a few months after New Super Mario Bros. 2. An absolute masterclass in the exact same thing. It looked the same, it sounded the same, it played the same, it was way too much of the same sort of good thing. 
these two games in particular coming out right on top of each other was such a one-two punch of oversaturation, it poisoned the name of New Super Mario Bros. so badly that it's still pretty dang poisonous to this day. I know better to say anything is permanently marred on the internet, but this one sure has staying power. More to the point though, New Super U might have been a good time to me, but it didn't really make the gamepad feel like much more than an optional gimmick which is quickly going to become a theme, but the first game we played was like a sampler platter of everything this new hardware was capable of, and a damn fun game in its own right, Nintendo Land. This is a showpiece for the Wii U's initial mission statement. It's not like Wii Sports was. It's not ignoring Nintendo's iconic franchises in a bid to appeal to a new audience. Instead, it's embracing that legacy in a unique way, portraying Nintendo's history as part of a well-characterized and cohesive theme park, and building fun, interesting, and in some cases surprisingly deep minigames around each one of them. Seriously, I'm still impressed by how much nuance there is to the controls in this Bloon Fight game. The Wii U, as conceptualized, was very much a communal console. That couch multiplayer experience was key to the pitch. Some of the best games in this package even demand it, so I can see why Nintendo Land's novelty would fade pretty fast if you were approaching it by yourself. But I was lucky enough to be in college. I still had a continuous stream of friends and acquaintances and people coming in and out of my life. And through that lens, Nintendo Land would be a mainstay at our hangouts for years to come. I remember playing it that first night, just bouncing from game to game, and feeling really excited at how much potential I saw in it. The DS came out shaky and weird and experimental, but proved its worth as developers got a handle on it. Nintendo Land seemed like a proof of concept that made me confident the same would happen with the Wii U. At 32 games, the launch lineup was substantial. Considering how successful the Wii had been, Nintendo didn't seem to have trouble convincing publishers to throw their weight behind the new console. But there was a noticeable tinge of caution to their optimism. Most of their efforts were ports, and in a lot of cases they were ports of games that were a little long in the tooth. Now they weren't just ports, they had new features that took advantage of the gamepad, but they were still mostly games that if you wanted to play them, you'd probably done it somewhere else already. The fact is, most people buy Nintendo consoles to play Nintendo games, and third parties surely knew this. The other fact is, the Wii U released at a really awkward time. Its hardware specs were, roughly, on par with the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3, two consoles that were both more than a little long in the tooth themselves by this point, and that would both have their successors released in about a year's time. And while that withered technology approach to hardware prowess had been to the Wii's benefit, game development was getting so expensive, and development for an HD system was so expensive anyway, that it wasn't going to be worth it to make Wii U versions of next-gen games unless the platform was massively successful. Because if it wasn't, Nintendo was going to get left in the dust as soon as the PS4 and Xbox, I don't know, 720 or something, as soon as they arrived. So they had to make their mark now, and they were off to a fairly strong start. The Wii U sold out at retail on day one, sold out again at its first restock, and sold out again on Black Friday 2012. But most of those early sales were coming from us ride-or-die Nintendo fans buying it on potential. The real litmus test was going to be how it held up afterward. Would strong word of mouth turn it into a Wii-level phenomenon? Or maybe it was just going to hold steady and grow into that success. I broke in my new system through the holidays. I tried out some fantastic indie games like Little Inferno and Nano Assault Neo. I discovered one of my favorite games ever made in Sonic and All-Stars Racing Transformed. I guess more than anything else, I felt relieved. It had been a little touch and go there for a while, but the system came out and I got it in my hands and I really loved my Wii U. And I couldn't wait for more people to get theirs and see why. I felt more secure than ever that before long, my cautious optimism wouldn't need to be so cautious. And then it was January 2013. The holiday sales numbers came back, and shit hit the fan. Ubisoft had thrown its weight behind the Wii U early on. It almost seemed like they might be to the Wii U what Capcom was to the Dreamcast, in terms of quantity if not quality. They alone published almost a fifth of the launch day lineup. And while this included the expected slate of mass-market shovelware, it also featured some actual honest-to-god exclusives, built from the ground up to mine the potential of the Wii U's multi-screen setup. While other third parties were erring on the side of caution, Ubisoft seemed to be doing the exact opposite. 
Zombie U in particular was an innovative permadeath horror game that made the gamepad central to survival, and early adopters rewarded their efforts by making it the best-selling third-party launch game. With the holidays behind us, the next big game those early adopters were looking forward to was also one from Ubisoft, Rayman Legends. A stunningly gorgeous 2D platformer that was, once again, purpose-built for the Wii U. An entire playable character was designed around the gamepad, and it looked way more sophisticated than anything Nintendo had done with Mario. The game was scheduled for release on February 26th, and the hype in the fledgling Wii U community was palpable. This was one of those cases where I was literally counting down the days. I mean, I'd spent hours just playing the demo, but I would have to keep counting. Two weeks before release, with the discs printed, the cases packed, the game so complete that it was purportedly already on the shipping trucks, Ubisoft delayed it. They delayed it by seven months. Why? Because they wanted to port it to the Xbox 360 and PS3 and release it on all three consoles at the same time. Nintendo fans were raging, of course they were, but even the game's developers were furious. They had crunched all through the holidays, and well before, to have Rayman Legends ready on time, and it was all for nothing. But the decision came from on high. Wii U owners might have made Zombie U the best-selling third-party game on the system, but there just weren't nearly enough of us. The day that Rayman Legends was delayed was the day that I knew something had gone horribly wrong. And from then on, really, the writing was on the wall. Launch day would turn out to be the best third-party support the system would ever have. And with that began a very prolonged dry spell. There just wasn't much to play. Kalen, my partner in day one Wii U ownership, ended up selling his not even six months later. He told me that whenever a game came out that he actually wanted to play, he'd just come over and play mine. And I guess he had a point. I wasn't even playing mine. 2013 was the 30th anniversary of the Famicom, and to celebrate, Nintendo released a virtual console game every month that would only cost 30 cents. I remember halfway watching Sony's PS4 reveal event, while most of my attention was on the gamepad, where I was playing the original F-Zero for the first time. There really was nothing quite like Wii U-era Nintendo, for better and worse. Their competitors were drumming up hype for the next generation, one that would surely be greater and more wondrous than ever before, and Nintendo was basing its entire year around a celebration of their mascot's brother. I really do miss this Nintendo, like they never had a chance, but I miss them. The problem in 2013 was, there were entire months where, aside from breaking out Nintendo Land with the crew, the only time I ever even turned on my brand new system was just to buy an old game. Try it out for a few minutes. Poke around the interface. <sighs> the interface. If the Wii U hardware was function over form, the system software was just the opposite. I love the look of it. It predates the utterly monotonous trend where everything has to be simple flat shapes. It's all skew-morphic gradients, rounded edges, and transparent glass. Every system menu has its own little theme song, and it was always so charming to have that parade of Miis group up and start blasting Miiverse posts when you turn the system on. It's the Wii menu on steroids, and in terms of form, I absolutely adore it. But it's the Wii menu on steroids, with all of the pros and cons that come along with that. Because in terms of function, it's a very different story. For one thing, it's not very modular. Even though the Wii U is compatible with Wii modes and Pro controllers, and even though you can operate the system menu with them, there are still a lot of sub-menus that only function with the gamepad. What's that? You wanted to change system settings, but you've got the gamepad on the charge dock? Too bad, you still gotta get up and fiddle with it. But the original Wii menu was similarly stingy. You can't use it without the pointer unless you have a classic controller plugged in, and you can't operate it with GameCube controllers at all. But I'm willing to cut it a little more slack. It's six years older, and it was Nintendo's first real system menu, which I guess makes what I'm gonna say next even more damning. You know what else the Wii menu did have? Let's compare. I'm gonna cold boot both systems and get into a game. Here we go. Ladies, gentlemen, and others, the pancakes are on the griddle, and we are off to the races to play some Donkey Kong! And the Wii is done before its successor is even done booting. What an embarrassment. The Wii U is going to need to bring some more cookies next time if it wants to stand a chance. Yeah, the Wii may be older and way less powerful, but its interface is snappy. 
The Wii U menu has a lot more going on, but it loads like it's a pre-built Dell computer from the early 2000s, just crammed with bloatware. As pretty as the interface is, so much of it just feels like it's getting in the way. And this slow loading doesn't just apply for games. Any sub-menu, application, or just booting back to the system menu, it all takes forever and a day to load. But you want to know the worst part? It used to be worse! This is what it's like after a lifetime of firmware updates that significantly improved system speed and functionality. It took five months before it let you download anything on standby. It took almost a year before you could display original Wii games on the gamepad. Which is especially egregious given there's a built-in sensor bar up here, so clearly this functionality was intended from the start. It took over a year and a half before they added a quick start menu, allowing you to boot directly into a game without having to wait on the UI. And not even quick start is actually very quick. So much as I love how it looks, I hate to say it, but in terms of function, the Wii U UI is one of the worst I've ever used. And I guess that played a big part in why I hardly ever used Miiverse. Miiverse was a cool idea. It was basically a social network within the walled garden of the Wii U console. Nintendo set up a community board for each game, as well as temporary discussion boards for events like E3, and Wii U owners could post, draw, and discuss within them. Under intense moderation scrutiny, of course. Honestly, coming from the company that made friend codes a thing, to this day, I'm shocked that Nintendo was ever willing to try this, but it did seem to work well enough for what it was. The problem for me was, I had Facebook and Twitter and Skype and a thousand other avenues to discuss games, and none of them required me to shift the sluggish system menu into a different time zone to access them. I'm also not much of an artist, and tapping out messages on the touch keyboard was a chore. Also, a lot of the posts there were kind of, uh, juvenile? Like, they kept going viral for it, actually. It's almost as if children in 2013 lacked any experience with games that came out decades before they were even born. So I always got the feeling that the primary audience for Miiverse wasn't people who had Facebook and Twitter and Skype and their own smartphones. The primary audience for Miiverse was kids. And given how much nostalgia for it I'm starting to see these days, I think that was probably on the money. I can see why it would have been a lot of fun through that perspective. But for me, the best thing about it was how well integrated it was into Wii U software. I already mentioned the front end, but a lot of games would also pull data from Miiverse and show it to you in-game. This could take the form of gameplay tips, comments about specific stages or specific parts of stages, or fart jokes. Yeah, let's be real, Miiverse was mostly fart jokes. But still, this portrayal of an integrated community within the system made these games feel alive. And it's one aspect of the system that seems pretty ahead of its time. What wasn't ahead of its time, of its time, or representative of any time, was the Wii U's marketing. We'll make this quick. The only time's dropping fast, people. Boo! Time to upgrade to... Wii U. Yeah, these commercials were mocked religiously by everyone on the internet, and they still remain one of the most commonly cited reasons for the system's failure to pick up any steam. I can't say I ever saw one. I basically stopped watching TV the day we got high-speed internet in the mid-2000s, so hey, I was ahead of my time in that regard. But still, I gotta agree. Like, compare the slick, memorable ads that we launched with to this puerile corporate blandness. I wouldn't call it the primary catalyst, but it definitely didn't do Nintendo any favors. In light of all this, I kinda wanna say the Wii U might have launched too early. But I don't think delaying a year and coming out right on top of the Xbox One and PS4 would have been a good idea either. And hey, even the best-selling console of all time had a really weak launch lineup and took a year to really start firing. Nonetheless, for an entire year, Nintendo's lineup lacked a real killer app. We got a lot of ports, a lot of potential, and then for a long, long time, a lot of nothing. But the veil finally started lifting as summer turned to fall. Rayman Legends finally arrived, and despite what we'd been through to get it, the game was so good it was still worth the wait. The Wii U enjoyed its second, and really its last round of third-party support, one far more tepid and restrained than the first. A Batman game came out on launch day with full gamepad support for map and inventory management, and integrated those functions into a lot of the character's detective work and equipment. Its sequel came out on the Wii U 11 months later. You want to know what it did with the gamepad? They just kind of half-heartedly slapped a map down there. Oh, and they removed the multiplayer mode that was in the other versions. That kind of said it all. But Nintendo wasn't counting the Wii U out yet. In late August, ahead of the next-gen launch, the system got its first price drop, and Nintendo finally got another batch of first-party titles out. 
Unfortunately, this included sequels to games like Wii Sports and Wii Party, titles that had sold millions and millions of copies on the original Wii, but held basically no relevance or appeal to the hardcore Nintendo loyalists who were, to that point, the only people who had really supported the console. The fact that they came out anyway is another sign of how badly Nintendo's forecast missed the mark. Sinking development resources into these was like throwing money out the window, but by the time that became obvious, it was probably too late to pull them back. Fortunately, though, that wasn't all Nintendo had. After so many months of sitting on my hands, it was just so nice to finally have new games to play, talk about, and look forward to. But I also want to highlight a bit of a dark horse, and probably not the one you were expecting. Pokemon Rumble U was a very quirky but very simple game that finally revealed that weird glyph on the gamepad was in fact an NFC sensor. You'd go to GameStop, buy a Pokeball for $3, and find an adorable little low-poly Pokemon figure that you could scan into the game. I might have been a little into them. I remember binge-watching Breaking Bad for the first time while grinding up Mewtwo's stats on the gamepad. God, Jesse Pinkman is irredeemable for what he did here. Holiday 2013 would really be the Wii U's last chance. With the next-gen systems hitting the market, if the Wii U couldn't make a breakthrough now, it never would. And you all know how that went. Let me tell you the tale of two games. Super Mario 3D Land came out in late 2011, and you could almost feel the seismic shift as the 3DS's destiny was altered. The hype, the review scores, the sales, and above all else, the goodwill that it generated were all off the charts. It wasn't solely responsible for the handheld's turnaround, but I'll always remember it as the exact point where the 3DS hit that threshold, had that breakthrough, and went from being a punchline to a phenomenon. Super Mario 3D World hit the Wii U two years later, and the effect was... worryingly familiar. It reviewed extremely well, even better than its predecessor. And among Nintendo fans, on dedicated forums and subreddits, nobody wasn't playing it. The general consensus was that a clear frontrunner for the best game of the year had arrived. Outside of those spaces, it was as if Super Mario 3D World didn't even exist. It just completely failed to resonate with anyone who hadn't already bought in. And this would be, more or less, how every big Wii U exclusive would feel from then on. Despite a stronger lineup of games, and despite a price cut, the Wii U's second holiday was even worse than its first. Gaming hardware selling worse on its second holiday than it did in its first almost never happens. Almost never happens. The calendar turned to 2014. My favorite games of the previous year were celebrated only by an increasingly niche group of internet weirdos. Damning financial reports were cranked out as fast as the DS used to print money. Bloggers, professional journalists, and randos on Twitter all started calling for Nintendo to give up the ghost and just go third party already. And I started having this recurring conversation where some dude in one of my classes would find out that I was into games, ask me a certain question, and scoff at my answer. Oh, so do you, oh, so have, a you have a PlayStation, PlayStation or, an or an Xbox? Xbox. I, mostly I mostly play the Wii U, Wii U actually. actually. Okay, I've yeah, never I've even never heard, heard of that. Of that. Oh, are you a, you a PlayStation guy or an Xbox, or an Xbox guy? guy? I guess I'm, I guess a, GameCube I'm a GameCube guy. guy. Uh, you're, uh, you're such a like fruit. A fruit. Dude, Dude, what you got, a PS2 or an Xbox? The only console I need is the Dreamcast. The Dreamcast? Why? The graphics suck. I've been here before. The Wii U, like the GameCube, like the Dreamcast, had no problem selling through its initial shipments to die-hard loyalists. But once that well ran dry, almost nobody else was biting. The result was a sort of purgatory, where a small group of like-minded weirdos were the only people championing our favorite games. But from Shin Mu to Eternal Darkness, to Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze. No matter how good a game was, it could never resonate any further than us. And I guess I should say, there's always been some proportion of people who primarily just played Nintendo. But it hasn't usually felt like they were the only people. Let me give you an example. There's this awesome channel that uploads footage of big reveals from the Nintendo World Store in New York. Whenever I need a big hit of dopamine, I love watching this stuff. 
like a capacity crowd of people in front of a massive screen, losing their minds over the same stuff that made me lose my mind. But if you go back and look at what these presentations were like during the Wii U era, things were a lot more insular. Just a dozen or two dorks awkwardly crowded around a TV, but every bit is hyped. Honestly, there's a part of me that kind of misses this. There was a part of me, even at the time, that almost preferred it this way. Like, of course my console of choice is dying, and nobody knows my favorite games exist. Why wouldn't it be that way? It had almost always been that way. The circumstances made the Nintendo community of this era incredibly tight-knit. There was a real sense of camaraderie. We were all running against the wind. 2014 would be the closest thing the Wii U ever had to a heyday. I mean, by my count, only 33 games were physically released for it that entire year, but that's about as many as some consoles ever get. <laughs> but seriously, I guess it goes back to Nintendo's old mantra, quality over quantity. Sure, third-party support was practically non-existent, but a lot of Nintendo's own killer apps finally arrived. Just way too late for them to actually be killer apps. Now, admittedly, a huge part of the reason I was so satisfied with the Wii U's library came down to a matter of taste. Another 2D platformer. ANOTHER 2D PLATFORMER! Yeah, the Wii U had platformers like the Switch has cozy farming games. But platformer or not, all of these titles were received pretty much the same way Mario had been. The Wii U's reputation was so toxic at this point, nobody was willing to buy the system no matter how good its games were. But Nintendo sure did try. Console makers tend to be a lot more generous with their customers when they're on the back foot. And that goes for all of them, not just Nintendo. Whenever anyone does well for a generation or two, they tend to get kinda greedy and complacent, figuring that because they've conquered the market for now, they've conquered it forever. And that's when they make hilarious mistakes. But when a company is losing, it's a different story. That's how I ended up owning We Fit You. They basically gave it away. I spent 10 bucks on one of the several million used balance boards that were clogging up a corner of every GameStop in the country, paired that with a $20 fit meter, and Nintendo was like, yeah, fine, just take it. Oh, and they told me. A Nintendo who was winning would never give away a game for the cost of an accessory. They would never sell one of the best platformers ever made at a budget price. They'd never let you have the Metroid Prime Trilogy for only 10 bucks. And they would sure as hell never let you buy a Mario Kart game, a series destined to be one of the best-selling games on any Nintendo system it's on, and let you have another first-party exclusive for free just for buying it. Because they wouldn't need to. But this was Wii U era Nintendo, and they needed to. Occasionally, it really does pay to back the underdog. Bayonetta had come out on 360 and PS3 a few years earlier, and it already seemed like the definition of a cult classic. Well regarded, sure, but not commercially successful enough to warrant a sequel. Until, that is, Nintendo came along and financed one. And how do you think the diehard fans of a niche hardcore spectacle action game reacted to the news that they would need to buy a Nintendo console, no, a Wii console, in order to play it? Yeah, how'd you know? And take note, this is what they were saying about the Wii U before it was even out. My name is Reggie, I'm about kicking ass, I'm about taking names, and we're about making games. Once upon a time, when the new president of the company was allowed to use mild swears, and Zelda had finally stopped being Zelda, when motion controls were fresh, and Nintendo's attitude was fresher, for just a little while, the Wii was almost cool. But we were long, long past that point. Nintendo had gambled that they'd be able to hold onto the Wii's massive new audience, but that gamble had cost them the respect of the core gaming audience. But maybe there was still a chance. Nothing, but nothing Nintendo makes, ever generates more buzz or commands more attention than a new Super Smash Bros. I knew people who had never even considered getting a Wii U before, who were enraptured by the hype cycle for this game, who almost certainly would have become Wii U owners if Nintendo hadn't also released it on the 3DS and it came out almost two months ahead of the Wii U version. Of course, even if they'd released it day and date, the fact of the matter was that the Wii U was way too expensive relative to its competition and position in the market. The system's first price cut had come over a year earlier by this point, and it was only 50 bucks off, down to $300. Meanwhile, the PlayStation 4, a real next-gen console that was hitting its stride, could be had for just 100 more. 
The fact that Nintendo refused to budge here was curious. When the GameCube was floundering, Nintendo was aggressive. Not even two years after the Cube came out, the price had already been slashed to just $99. This made the GameCube an attractive choice and a bit of an impulse buy, particularly for families who had no idea how Nintendoomed the company supposedly was. They just recognized these characters and knew the name. Nintendo couldn't save the Purple Lunchbox's reputation then, but its reputation would be saved nonetheless. Millions of kids who never would have had a GameCube at $200 got one at $99. If Nintendo had pulled a similar trick for Holiday 2014, if they'd eaten the loss, drastically undercut the competition, and launched a revitalized blitz of an ad campaign alongside Smash 4, well, who knows? But not only did Nintendo not cut the price here in 2014, they would never cut it again. The Wii U would retail for $300 till its dying day. Between this and Smash on 3DS, it almost seemed like Nintendo didn't want more people to buy a Wii U. And, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, maybe they actually didn't. It had already taken aggressive price cuts to save the 3DS, and through this downturn, Nintendo CEO Satoru Iwata had docked his own salary multiple times to avoid laying anyone off. So maybe Nintendo had accepted what a lot of us already knew. There really was no saving the Wii U. And in fact, its successor was first officially discussed, sure enough, right here in early 2015. Of course, as soon as the internet heard the words NX, it was suddenly filled with demands that Nintendo should punt the Wii U immediately and refocus development only on their next system. I mean, nobody cared about this thing anyway, right? Well, look at where that got Sega. I think Nintendo learned from their example. Or they were just smart enough to know better from the beginning, but either way. Even if Nintendo accepted the Wii U was a bust, even as much ground as they'd lost on it, it would be so much more catastrophic if Nintendo earned a reputation for abandoning its hardware. Like, if you launch a game console, and potential customers don't have absolute confidence that you'll still be supporting that console in two or three years, then you won't still be supporting that console in two or three years. Nintendo supported the Wii U exactly enough, and exactly long enough, that those of us who bought the system early could still feel like we'd gotten a reasonable return on our investment. And more importantly, that everyone who hadn't bought one knew that. But they absolutely did not want a horde of new customers to pick up a Wii U in 2015 and then decide not to buy their next system in 2017. That's why the price stayed locked exactly where it was. They knew better than to say it, but Nintendo knew by now that the Wii U wasn't their future. After a solid year and a half of strong first-party software, Nintendo's release schedule took a noticeable step back. Maybe not in terms of quantity, but definitely in terms of quality. IPs that typically buoy the midpoint of a Nintendo console's life were notably lacking in features, if not missing in action entirely. Animal Crossing has gotten a mainline entry on almost every single piece of Nintendo hardware going back to the N64, except for this one. Wii U owners got a bizarre clock app and an undercooked, poorly thought out board game. Mario Tennis Ultra Smash was bland and bare bones, missing features, modes, and characters that had been staples of the series, and was by all accounts rushed to market for the holidays, when Platinum Games needed a little more time for something we'll talk about later. But there was one saving grace at this time. Nintendo stumbled upon a business that was booming. They say pictures speak louder than words, or something like that. So let me show you a picture that I took in January of 2015. Pokemon Rumble was just a dry run. Amiibo hit right in the heart of the Toys to Life craze, and they were such a phenomenon that they were one of the only artifacts of that fad that survived beyond it. Amiibo were announced with one of the most unhinged, out-of-pocket, and above all, best trailers to ever grace the industry. And you know, when I look back now on 2015, on how it felt to be a Wii U owner, to be a Nintendo fan in that era, you might be surprised to hear that I don't remember it being nearly as bad as it might have seemed from the outside looking in. I mean, like I said, I'd been here before. I'd weathered the GameCube years. I knew no matter what they said, Nintendo wasn't doomed. So, I just rode out the storm. I remember how much time I spent with the virtual console games, and how perfect the gamepad was for them. For years and years, hardly a night went by where I didn't kick back before bed and play a few classics. GBA and DS games were both added to the lineup, and the gamepad felt like it was absolutely tailor-made for them. 
I've talked a lot about how being a Wii U owner felt kinda like being shipwrecked on an island with a dozen other weirdos. How nobody outside of us even seemed to be aware that the games that we loved existed. But when I think of 2015, two games really come to mind. Two games that were unique, irrevocably bound to the Wii U's core design concept, and exceptional. Two games that were exceptions to the rule. Splatoon was a brand new IP unlike anything Nintendo had ever made before. More importantly, it was like nothing else anyone had ever made before. An online multiplayer shooter that seemed to effortlessly strike that elusive balance. Family friendly but cool. Approachable but engaging. Bright and energetic, but dripping with style. Nintendo hadn't really focused much on new IPs since the turn of the millennium. Masahiro Sakurai famously lamented how the then seven-year-old Pikmin was the newest franchise in Brawl. But Splatoon was like the first hint of where Nintendo was going, that first breath of what would come to define the company's next era. But as big as Splatoon was, that breakthrough paled in comparison to this one. It's funny, when Mario Maker was revealed at the previous year's E3, I don't remember anyone thinking that much of it. Like, the pitch was so simple and straightforward. Create your own Mario levels. It sounded neat, but a little niche. Mario had long since reached a saturation point, so this was only really gonna appeal to your super hardcore fans who were already making Kaizo ROM hacks anyway, right? But this game, just like the games it lets you imitate, is an apex example of how much depth can hide beneath the surface of simplicity. Its creation tools were comprehensive and complete, yet easy to learn and use. But what ultimately made this game so magical was the unbridled freedom for whatever unconventional ideas your imagination could spark. Lakitu's throwing Goombas, stacks of Koopa Troopas topped with a piranha plant, question blocks with hammer bros in them, a mushroom in a clown car, you could explore basically any weird-ass combination of ideas that you'd never see in a traditional Mario game. And it was compatible with nearly every single amiibo that had been released to that point, giving creators even more options for creativity and theming. All of this wrapped in a package that seemed to call back to and celebrate the inherent weirdness of Mario's early days. This was not the squeaky clean Mr. Video game we'd been leaning toward since the series jumped to 3D. This was the Mario mania of the 80s, the Mario I was too late to grow up with, made magic again. This all provided the foundation for what really made Mario Maker such a phenomenon, the community. Nintendo gave them the tools, and creators pushed the envelope of what was possible with them, leading to a cavalcade of viral videos that made Nintendo feel relevant and contemporary in a way they hadn't in years. In the fall of 2015, the only thing bigger than Mario Maker was Undertale. Everything about this system, from the interface to the design to everything in between, was purely, perfectly, cohesively Wii U. It could not and would not work nearly as well on anything else. Super Mario Maker was a perfect storm for everything that made the Wii U special, at what was, unfortunately, anything but the perfect time for the Wii U itself. But I've often wondered how different things might have been if this had been the Wii U's big launch game instead of this. If Mario Maker had kicked up this much dust three years earlier, it really could have been that killer app the Wii U so desperately needed. But if Super Mario Maker was a perfect storm of everything right about the Wii U, Star Fox Zero was the antithesis of that. Yeah, this is what Platinum Games and Nintendo had spent basically the whole generation working on together. Released early in 2016, it's not literally this, but I always remember it as the penultimate Wii U game. One of the biggest reasons the Wii U's dual screens didn't ever hit the same way the DS's eventually did, or at least the reason DS-style games had trouble working the same way on it, was the simple fact that you couldn't actually see both screens at once. Flicking your eyes between two screens that are equidistant from your face was pretty easy to pick up, it was surprisingly natural. But completely turning your attention from the TV to a hunk of plastic you're holding in your hands and refocusing your eyes was anything but. I've played this thing more than almost anyone, and it still throws me off when a game expects me to do it. It feels weird and uncanny and even immersion-breaking. But that was everything that Star Fox Zero's game design was built on. It was almost like they expected you to play two games at once. 
you needed to take in your surroundings and maneuver through obstacles on the TV, while also precision aiming your shots with the gamepad's gyro controls, sometimes shooting at things that you couldn't even see at all on the TV. But the first time I played it, I had a strange sense yet again. I'd been here before. I was eight years old. I'd made it to the first Bowser level in Super Mario 64, and no matter how slow I was, how careful I was, and how many agonizing minutes it took me to claw my way back here, I could not for the life of me cross this stupid little teeter-totter without falling off and having to do the whole level over again. But it wasn't my fault! It was because of this stupid little analog stick. In that moment, if I could have just reached over here and played the game with the D-pad that I knew so well, I would have. But the N64 was the first console to come standard with an analog controller. You couldn't move Mario at all with the D-pad. If you were holding the controller the way Nintendo wanted you to, you couldn't really even reach it. This trident-shaped controller cut players and developers off from being able to rely on what they already knew. Because Nintendo knew the analog stick would expand the possibility space of how games could play and what they could be, and they forced the industry to come to grips with it. So I stuck with it, I persevered, and before long, that analog stick felt every bit as natural to me as the D-pad ever had. I always remembered that lesson. Even if a game seems frustrating at first, even if an unfamiliar control scheme seems complicated or off-putting, I try to stick with it. I try to see it through. So, I stuck with Star Fox Zero. I played it, I beat it, I replayed it over and over again. Perhaps most importantly, I learned that it was much, much, much easier and faster to just hit the minus button to swap views than it was to look down at the gamepad. But somewhere in all of that, Star Fox Zero didn't just become a good time, it ascended to, honestly, one of my favorite games of its generation. It is bar none my favorite Wii U exclusive that is still an exclusive. And I fully expect it to stay that way. Uh, people who've played it enough will know. The game design is woven so intricately into the Wii U hardware that to do it on any other platform would require it to become a completely different game. But it did probably help that the Wii U had been my console of choice for so long, so the learning curve wasn't as steep for me. I felt like I was putting every little skill I'd picked up through that time and then some to use. The gyro aim in Splatoon, the tilt momentum of Nintendo Land, the dual screen gameplay of Wonderful 101, I'd been training for this through the Wii U's entire life. And here at the end of it, Star Fox Zero tested me and rewarded me with a game like no other. But that's the conceit, isn't it? The skills I'd learned in Mario 64 were applicable in every 3D game released since. The skills I earned in Star Fox Zero were good in Star Fox Zero and absolutely nothing else. Mario 64 was a landmark game that redefined the industry. The Wii U was a console that people already couldn't wait to forget. There would never be anything else like it, because the market had so thoroughly rejected it. Fewer than 20 games trickled out through the rest of 2016, and most of them were low budget. A couple of party games, some kid-focused shovelware, but also a curious remake. Twilight Princess was the very game that had crossed generations a decade earlier, signaling the end of an era that had seemed so dire for Nintendo, and the beginning of something better. The Wii was once a revolution. It had once been a breath of fresh air. Together with the DS, it had brought Nintendo back to the top of the industry, upending the rules of what games could be and who could play them. It was a position Nintendo had pushed for numerous times throughout its existence. Refusing to conform, refusing to let game design, input methods, or players themselves become too standardized or set in their ways. I said a long time ago, the Wii was lightning in a bottle but it was also a fad. Hard truth, I know, as I write these words, and now again as I speak these words, the Wii is starting to garner more retrospective appreciation than it ever had in its own time. But that's inevitable, right? Every Nintendo console introduces a new group of kids to video games, and they always eventually grow up and tell each other how that system was the absolute best ever. But the Wii, much as I loved it then, much as I still love it now, was a fad. Nintendo failed to recognize it was a fad, and that is what doomed the Wii U more than anything else. But, and this is important, it is so much easier to say that with hindsight. People have this tendency to predict Nintendo's future based entirely on their recent past. When the Wii U was being conceived, Nintendo was dominating the seventh generation, to the point that Sony and Microsoft were left scrambling to grab a piece of that new audience that Nintendo had uncovered. 
And in 2009, with the Wii on top of the world and retailers still struggling to keep it in stock, I'm sure the Wii U seemed like a pretty safe bet. Why would you not follow up the most successful console you've ever made with more of the same? But I think this is where Nintendo, and Microsoft for that matter, fell into this trap where they assumed that what had worked would keep working, that they had created a whole new audience of loyal customers who'd be chomping at the bit to pick up their next console, that they would be able to capture the zeitgeist the same way their predecessors had. The thing is though, when a kid grows up with a Nintendo, a lot of them buy the next Nintendo, and the next Nintendo, and a lot of them never stop. When my parents bought a Nintendo, they got their fill of Wii Sports and then went right back to not buying video game consoles. Targeting this audience again was absolutely the wrong call, but the industry had no real way of knowing that at the time. The Wii was once a revolution, but the revolution was pushed well beyond its expiration date. Rising dev costs made innovation far riskier than it ever was before. The blue ocean had dried up at the start of the decade and never came back, and the market that was left just wanted Nintendo to trim the fat, stop with the gimmicks, and just go back to making video game consoles already. People always predict Nintendo's future based on their recent past. The Wii U was stuffed full of bloated features that drove the price up and made the interface a chore to use, so surely the next system would be hamstrung by a gimmick too. The Wii U failed, so conventional wisdom would tell you their next console would too. And when it did, Nintendo would finally have no choice but to throw in the towel, do what Sega did, and go third party. But of course that's not what happened. Instead, Nintendo played their hand to perfection, cast away the albatross that the Wii brand and its associated iconography had become, reinvented their console business, and thrived once again. The interface was snappy and no nonsense. The games were groundbreaking and in focus. The marketing was on point. The Switch broke from the Wii U mold so completely that the dock unnecessarily covers up the screen. It's the Trident controller all over again. They cut developers off from even thinking about using it as a second screen. But this new era started not unlike the previous one, with a Zelda game that crossed between the generations. Breath of the Wild has turned out to be one of the most important and influential games of recent memory. But while it'll always be remembered as the Switch's killer app, it was a Wii U game first. As monumental as it is, and as much as I still love it, I think it also serves as a perfect example of what was lost when Nintendo trimmed the fat of its failure. The Sheikah Slate is basically a representation of the Wii U gamepad, and early previews showed how much of the game was meant to be connected to it, to be defined by it. It was integrated so deep that when the call came down that they were going to port it to the Switch, the team had to considerably rework the game mechanics and even the story to make that happen. So in the final release of Breath of the Wild, you want to know what the gamepad does? Nothing. Not even a map. And that kind of says it all. But as sad as that might seem, that the Wii brand and function and iconography and style had to all be stripped away like this, I know it was ultimately the right choice. Much as I enjoyed the system and its games, the Wii U was absolute poison. Breath of the Wild never would have been so influential, and Nintendo never would have made the comeback they have if they had kept going the way they were. The Switch has now become the most successful game console Nintendo's ever made, but a lot of that success, especially early on, was buoyed by ports of nearly every single major release the Wii U ever had. It proved the point. The problem was always the platform, not the games on it. The market wanted Nintendo's games, their IPs, their distinct style and approach to game design, but it didn't want the Wii U. And as someone who loved and still loves the Wii U, that was always a little bittersweet. Not to mention bizarre, to see a whole new audience react to games I had bought, played, loved, and moved on from years earlier like they were brand new releases. But to so many people, they basically were. From a certain point of view, I guess the Wii U, or at least its library, has been vindicated. And the Switch still includes what might actually be the gamepad's best feature, and does it better than its predecessor ever could. But as we stand now on the cusp of a new generation, I see a whole lot of people making the same old predictions. Nintendo's just gonna do exactly what they did again. Their next console's just gonna be a more powerful Switch. And honestly, I guess I'd be fine with that. But I also kinda hope it isn't. Nintendo needed to take this gen to heal. They needed to give the market exactly what it wanted. But I felt the industry was a little stale for the past few years, and I'd love to see Nintendo push for something fresh, something new, something with the potential to shake things up again.
Today, the Wii U is at best remembered as a somewhat unfortunate console that was brought down by too many changing market conditions, too many missteps, and maybe a pinch of hubris. Those with a little more bitterness might argue it was the lowest point in Nintendo's history. A time when the company went all in on gimmicks to the detriment of the games they made so well. A time when they were aggressively out of touch and bullishly ignorant of what both the market and their most hardcore fans wanted. But regardless of how full the glass might have been, it can't be argued that the Wii U era was a very troubled time for Nintendo, and one that they only escaped by pivoting away from every mistake that defined it. But you gotta remember, ten years ago, that was exactly what we said about the GameCube. The GameCube lost. The Nintendo 64 lost. The Dreamcast certainly lost. But the way these consoles lived didn't define the memories they created, the passions they inspired, or the way they were remembered. It always took time, but time was all it took. I watched it happen. And in some small way, a decade ago, I made it happen. Now, I'm not saying that is or isn't what'll happen this time. I don't know the future, but I know from experience, the Wii U's legacy is still being written. It just won't be on me to write it this time. Thank you all for watching, and thank you for letting me do this for a decade. For ten years, you've kept geeking, and for hopefully way more than ten more, I'll keep critiquing. Thank you guys.